everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I thought I'd start off by, uh, well, I actually couldn't find a place for this, but I love this quote, so I want to put it right there. Um, so I want to tell you a quick rundown of who I am and what I do. So to start, I'm a musician. That's what I tend to do most of my days, uh, playing a lot of music, but then I also wrote a book, like you heard, but packing your suitcase for real, Z for reals. Uh, I'm an animator. I like to do a lot of stop motion. And um, I like taking pictures like this because I love pattern repeat and symmetry. Uh, this is what I wish I looked like. This guy's awesome. This is my dog, Beckham. Uh, this is me being me. And uh, this is our theme. So play. Um, so to start off, I really need your help. So who has an iPhone 5? Anyone iPhone 5? The people in the front, I need about like, at least 15 to 20 people. Can you just stand up and come up here really quickly? I'm actually, I, yeah, I need an ADL to pull out the, pull out the, the cameras and uh, the camera. I need, uh, we're going to take some shots, okay? We're going to try a little thing. Yeah, and actually I need a volunteer, meaning my wife. Get over here. So, yeah. So if we can come up, just come up on stage. We need more than that. Come on, who's got an who's got iPhone 5? Come on. It has to be 5 for a specific reason because it's technically it'll all be the same dimensions. Yeah, so, yeah, wrap her up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you guys to basically create a circle. So create a circle around the podium. Yeah, and kind of space it out. Space it out. So even some people back here a little. Yeah, this is this is perfect. And so now here's here's the guidelines. So I want it to be. I need you to take a picture, a horizontal shot, and use the button on the side. Yeah, to to hit the trigger. So that one, because that one goes right away and it won't fo it won't worry about focusing. So this is a little little bit of madness. Um, we're going to be taking a picture. We're going to be focusing on Liana. So on this little creative morning sign that you and that you've you may have doodled. This one. You may have doodled a little bit. So she's the she's the focal point. No, just we're going to do one shot. So stand right in the middle. Actually, come up on stage. Okay. So she's the focal point. I'm going to be here. Don't worry about me. But I'm going to jump. And when I jump, that's kind of when I want you to take a picture. So if you can see a bit of me, perfect. If not. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So let's maybe the, make, fill in this yeah, gap a little bit here. And if you guys could kind of create a little, it's just around here. So it's like as, as close to like evenly spaced out as possible. So if you don't mind, just move right here. Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, and I'm going to give you numbers, yes. So remember your number, OK? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. So OK. <laughs> So I'm gonna t we're gonna I'm gonna jump, and you're gonna try and capture me in the air because you know if you saw my little intro video I like to frolic so this is kind of me just being Sean, so I'm gonna try and capture me in the air okay we'll try it twice okay one, two, three, okay one more try, one, you can have your hands out all right you can you can already hit me you're hitting me with the power of creative mornings all right that's gonna win. one two three. <laughs> Okay, so now you can head back to your seats, but I need you to email it to me at howtopack at gmail.com right now. Okay, so on your way back, and with, it, with your number as a subject. And uh, so remember your number, put it as a subject, email me at howtopack. Size large. <laughs> Hopefully you heard enough of that. Um, how to, sorry, howtopack at gmail.com. All righty. So play is, uh, that's kind of, I, I tend to like to play in whatever I do. And uh, so when, when Mark asked me to speak, it was uh, how can I involve something else where I don't actually have to speak? That's a little bit of what that was, but it's also, you know, having fun with the theme and having fun with the idea of it. Playing, we're all playing here. So it's just for fun. So definitions of play, I know everyone kind of, it seems like we all have our own definitions. And when I say play to someone, which I asked a lot of people, it was interesting to hear their answers because it didn't matter what profession they were in, they all had their own versions. So 
you know, we all have our own. Um, for me, as you may have noticed, I'm a bit nerdy, I'm a bit uh, mathematical, I'm, I'm a logical thinker. So I tend, to, I tend to go to the dictionary for my definition. Um, so really it's not me. But uh, it's for the enjoyment and recreation rather than for a serious practical or, sorry, or practical purpose. Um, I think that's really the en enjoyment and recreation. Um, enjoyment and recreation. Uh, second of all, the big word here is, is by children. A lot of people I spoke to mention children. They play, when they think of play, they, they think of children. Um, I think that's pretty powerful. So, uh, you know, the question is, why does children stand out? Why can't we play as much? It's a uh, great photo. I think that, that uh, captures that from my friend uh, Dave Delnia, who shot this. Uh, he actually did it for fun. It wasn't for a project. But, he, um, but I just love it. I love what it looks like. I just love the, the feeling that comes from it. But uh, it makes me think, you know, because I asked him as well, what does play mean to you? And he, and he said, letting go of inhibitions. And I think he nailed it there. Uh, but why is it that children are so much better that, at that than we are? So what happens? And when do we change? When do we become serious? I kind of wanted to put a picture of the, the Joker, like, why so serious? But I, I didn't. I remember, uh, for me, when I, was, when I was in elementary school, my best friend was a, a little year, I think he was a year older than me, and he was going into high school. And, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, okay, he's in high school, that's cool, that's great. I called him up the first day and I said, hey, Trevor, how you doing? Hey, wanna come over and play? And it was like, at that moment, I, I, I can't say play in front of my, he's, he's a high school student now. I can't, I don't think I can use the word play anymore. And I was afraid that, you know, 10 years of friendship had gone down the tube because I said play. But it was, it was just a, a crazy thought. And, and like, well, maybe, maybe now is the time that I need to start thinking seriously or that I need to start talking seriously. Or maybe this is time for serious learning. It, it was, for me, it was that, that switch even going into high school. But, um, you know, I think for children, the play is, is serious learning. And uh, there's a wonderful quote by... Mr. Rogers here says, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. And uh, there's one other one here. <laughs> when we treat children's play as serious as it deserves, we are helping them feel the joy that is found in the creative spirit. It's the things we play with and the people who help us play that make a great difference in our lives. Um, one, my family laughed because that's actually me. <laughs> Two, I love, the word, I love the word joy in this. They feel the joy that's to be found in the creative spirit. And I feel like that we are, we are all still looking for that joy when we're looking for things to, be, to create and to go out of our occupation, even if our occupation is what a lot of people assume is fun. Um, we're constantly looking for that, for that joy. So it's important. Um, so it's not just for kids. Play is important for all of us. Uh, it's, it's important to renew our creativity, whether we're a musician, a marketer, a game designer, or pro athlete. I think we all need to find our way to get out of that and do something just for fun. It's, it's important. We need to branch out. Um, and, and this is for ourselves and for no other reason. It's not to get paid, it's not for recognition, and it's not for someone else. We need to, we need to make sure we renew that joy within us when we play. For me, I, in the music industry, um, what I loved about it is I loved just spending the time with the people, with, with the, the camaraderie of, of the bands, and really just, I don't think there are as many professions that get to, you may not know this band very well, maybe they're on the other side of the country, they don't play the same style of music, but hey, let's all hop in a van and drive for six weeks across the country. You know, like, it doesn't happen as much, but I love that about the music industry, because it's such a, it's a, it's a people thing, and from there, you can really just, I think it helps us all broaden our, our own definition of the word play as well. You know, whether it be musically, your style, stylistically, we can all learn from other people. And I think that's the important part. So I, coming together is great. Um, it just it broadens our own ideas of how to play. And uh, as a reminder of what Mr. Rogers said, you know, it's the things we play with and the people who help us play that make a great difference in our lives. Uh, so a, a random shot on, on tour a couple years ago with Tegan and Sarah, and that's uh, Jack from the band Fun, but he was in, uh, that's his own band that he was touring with us, Steel Train. So I had a lot of fun with them. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a common thread in all of us in our need and desire to play. And 
job titles don't matter when we play. It's, it's about playing. We can put that aside. Uh, I was sitting down and, and I asked another friend of mine, Matt Watson, he's a soccer player for the Whitecaps. And, and I asked him the question, you know, and, and to me, as a big soccer fan, I thought, well, he's obviously just going to say play and that'll be it. But he's, he's like, okay, wh what does play mean to me? And he thought, well, yeah, soccer. I, I'm, uh, I, I like, yeah, it's, it's soccer. But then, you know, like there's a bit of a pause. He's like, but music, actually. For me, music is my way to create. I love playing soccer. That's what I do. But I love making beats as well. And I love creating music. And I love that. And I, and I love that, you know, he acknowledged the need to play in other areas as well, outside of his really cool profession. Um, and I didn't notice this probably until a little later in, uh, in my life than probably than I should have. But when I was writing this book I was telling you about, this nerdy book, uh, for me, it was this creative process that I hadn't done before. I'd been playing a lot of music, and I enjoy playing music, and I still enjoy playing music. But this was different. Uh, for one, I was a math nerd, <laughs> and I hated writing in high school. So this was a change. I'm like, I'm actually writing a book now. But it was the, it was the connection and the collaboration with all the people that really made it for me. It was, it was me connecting with my musician friends on a level that I rarely got to see. Finally, we weren't talking about music. We were talking about nerdy things like how to pack your suitcase. Uh, and I loved seeing the joy that they would get into talking about something other than music and the things that, basically the mundane parts of life <laughs> that we all have to do and never get to talk about. So, you know, some people got it. Some people were super passionate about it, like my friend Graham right here from Tokyo Police Club. I asked him about, you know, well, what's your shower method? I probably sent him a mathematical equation of how often you should shower on tour. And he was like, dude, you're overthinking it, man. You just this. Where's the water coming from? That's all you need to know. And, um, and, I, and I love that because cause that's what, it kind of made me go deeper. And then there's others who challenged my methods and they're like, well, I do it this way because of this. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's a good point. And, and me wanting to be the professor, you know, the, I'm the, t no, no, I know, I know everything here. It challenged me to dive deeper, or as I like to say, to, to, to nerd down deep. And, um, and I love that. I, I, you know, I love the collaborative process. It wasn't about writing, it was about spending time with people and seeing how far the, and how inspired they get. Because inspiring, or sorry, because passion inspires people. A um, couple of shots for the book that is just, you know, human Tetris game, random sock bird, you know, <laughs> the huge. So playing with others is a good thing. Um, like children, we should all play together. And uh, collaborating is worthwhile. And if you if you got the email from Creative Mornings last week about debunking the you know top ten myths of creativity, there was this one uh, one section. I was reading through it. I'm like, oh, that's good, that's good. And then there was this one, and it said, going out of your creative bubble is the best way to be creative. And they were saying that's not the case. When you're in your creative zone, you're a lot more free to. And I was like, yeah, I didn't really like that because for me. The whole point of this talk was to be expanding our, expanding our definition of play. And I wanted to go outside of our boundaries. I wanted to do that. But then it dawned on me what it's really saying is that, is, is, is kind of reinforcing the fact that I want to collaborate with people, that I think it's important to collaborate with people because where we start to get weaker or we start to get afraid to do, that may be that person's strong house. And maybe, that's, maybe that's where they come from. And so together, I, I think we can provide the gift of confidence to each other. And we're allowing ourselves to expand. And I think that's really cool. Um, some of the big famous collaborators were, uh, well, this dude. Um, he's often pictured alone. But there's a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people know that he actually had about 100 collaborators. Uh, this is, I was reading a little book from Vera John Steiner, who's a leading scholar on creativity at the University of New Mexico. And she was saying that you know, he had so many collaborators. Obviously, the, the big one being Niels Bohr, uh, who contributed to the contribution of contemporary physics, the two of them together. Uh, so the, the two of them worked on a lot of things. And, uh, and even though he was photographed alone, there's a lot of people that came and take, uh, helped him in that. And I was doing some fact checking as well, just to make sure. And then I realized, oh wait, no, I've heard about it lots of time on Big Bang Theory. He always talks about, <laughs> you know, he always talks about Niels Bohr. Good old Sheldon. Bazinga. Um, <laughs> Picasso and Cubism. Cubism was, his, uh, was a big style of art that him and Georges Braque collaborated on for, for seven years. 
Apparently, they wouldn't go a day without seeing each other's work, and they'd even sign the back of each other's artwork. And th the point of that was to keep the focus on the innovation rather than who did what work. I think that's really amazing. And then uh, one, more, one more guy, uh, Keith Sawyer, who is an expert on creativity. Um, he's got a bunch of other titles, but really all you need to know is he designed video games for Atari for a couple years. So that, uh, that's pretty cool. But he was saying that researchers have, have even found that the mind in itself is filled with all kinds of internal collaboration, and that those insights that emerge when you're completely alone can even be traced back to previous collaborations. So if you think you do your best work on your own, chances are it could also stem from the work you've done with other people. So most importantly, play. You know, Whether it's with others or by yourself, it's still important to get out there and, and play. And, and I don't think it's, we don't want to be afraid to play. In fact, you know, if you're, even if you're terrible at it, you never know what can come from it. When you start, you never know where it'll go. Even if you, if you start a project and then you, you spend the next couple months struggling with it, you're, you're having such a hard time and you, you don't even like it. You put it aside and what if your friend walks in and they're like, whoa, what's that? And you're like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, it's, yeah. But what if that inspires them and they think, well, you, you didn't even enjoy it, but I think this is amazing. And then maybe they start a project that they were afraid of because you overcame your fears. So there's a great quote from Seth Godin uh, about art is a personal act of courage, something one human does that creates change in another. So what if it creates change in another? Uh, a little while back, my family and I, we, we all did a Myers-Briggs type test together. And uh, we had to study this one picture. So we were doing it as a group, and the picture was a, like a sunset um, over a lake. And we were all asked to write down the things that we, we thought about this. And so I'm like, OK, that's no problem, easy. My wife, Liana, she goes first to describing it. She's like, oh, it it's, makes me feel warm, makes, reminds me of summer. Oh, I, and camp? Oh, I like, yeah, this is, I like this. And I'm, and I'm looking at her, I'm so confused, I'm looking at the photo. What are you talking about? And I'm like, first of all, the horizon's crooked. There's no focal point. This is a mediocre sunset at best. Like it just, I didn't understand where she was coming from. The point is, we all see things differently. Not everyone is going to love what we love, and that's OK. So release your work, artwork to the world, even if you don't feel it's done, even if you don't love it. Next, I want to get better at failing. Um, I like the shot because really, even in the greatest of failures, there's probably always at least something that's a winner in there. So the idea is to get bent, to find, go back, find what, want, find what you did well in that failure, and move on and go to the next one. So I don't know if the, uh, is there a USB, anything? In one minute, no problem, yeah. So yeah, the idea is really, don't be afraid to go out and fail. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. So this morning, when I had you guys come up here, take the pictures, um, I had no idea about this environment. And it was a little bit of a scary thing for me because I envisioned this one really cool concept of basically showing the power of creativity. And um, it, made me, it made me laugh when I got in here. I was like, oh, there's a stage. I don't know. I wanted to get to a perfect circle to be around here and wanted to create this thing. And um, Luke, you can just bring it up here if you want. And so I wanted to create something special for this morning that was kind of on the fly, showing a bit of form of creativity from all of you guys. So the idea was to have you noodle. Thank you. It was to have you noodle. And where's the USB? And essentially, we could all be problem solving 101. Put USB in slot. I got it. Thank you. All right, Mark, how do I get out of this slideshow for a moment here? Woohoo! Um, so the idea is that maybe, potentially, we all may have a part in failing this morning to start our day off, but we can see what we did well, OK? So I had you guys take the photos, obviously. You guys are all in the shot. I had you guys hopefully doodle on that little piece of paper on the front when you're doing your name tags. Uh, I've got music from my friend Matt from uh, the Whitecaps. And so his music in the background, and then my wife doing a little voiceover. So 
Let's see how this actually works. Let's see how it turns out. You might need to drag it onto the monitor. Monitor? Okay. What? Where is the monitor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Look at that. We are Creative Morning. And this is how we play. <laughs> So the idea was to have like that matrix scene, you know, where you jump off and it like spins around. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of a fail. And, um, <laughs> and I'm okay with it. I'm not gonna lie. I'm okay with it. It's going back to here. So thank you for being part of it. Um, one more. I emailed my friend Seth Godin for the final thing. I asked him about play, and he said, play for keeps, or for fun, or best of all, both. And I think that's so fitting and, and amazing. Um, one, that he replied to me, because <laughs> we've never met. <laughs> Second of all, I think that's just amazing. So lastly, uh, go, start, and play uh, for keeps and for fun. So thank you, guys. Get back. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question for you. The thing I want to know, Sean, I appreciate what you said. <laughs> yep. I, acknowledge, uh, I acknowledge the importance of play, mm -hmm. um, but I struggle with that tension that you mentioned that you know, we, we are told and we start to believe, uh, truth or true or not, that it's somehow inappropriate. Or I think that, I mean, that for me it's like when I play, Mm -hmm. It feels unproductive. I've been, I've been conditioned that play is unproductive. It's a yeah. waste of time. Yeah. And I'm a busybody. So how do you handle that? How do you give yourself permission? Where, where, where do you draw from to say, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play now? Uh, should I speak in here? Yeah. Um, I, w I would fight that notion that we have been ingrained to that is not productive. And I would say it is productive. Um, I think that... There are a lot of times when, when we're in a better mindset of playing, where we're a little bit more free and open, we can, we can grab onto tasks a lot easier. And I think we're more free to be able to do that. Um, I, actually, when I was looking for an Einstein uh, picture, um, I actually saw a couple quotes that he had. And he said um, something about the fact that play is the, is the highest form of research. And I think that's really cool. So just it's it's. Oh, so tell myself that I'm doing research. So you are. <laughs> and then yeah. go go karting. Pretty much. Well, it's it's you get a better bigger picture of it. Go go karting. <laughs> and you never know what you know that that uh, that email I was talking about. Yeah. The, the conference that they said when you're driving you do your best thinking a lot of times. Go karting could be too. So maybe you go go karting and you figure out you the best way. You do your best thinking on the, the floor of the bathroom in McDonald's. <laughs> Yeah, that was a little odd. Yeah. <laughs> He's still peeing. Flip him over. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, don't I don't want that visual. Sorry. <laughs> Please. Terrible. Okay, we're done. Good. Woo. Oh. Hi. How are you? Um, good, thanks. Uh, we were talking in a group a little bit about when work becomes play, like if you yeah. sort of achieved uh, doing work so, so well, like you're doing exactly what you want to do that it kind of becomes play. Yeah. Do you think that that's possible or do you think that you will always be trying to find something else that's, that's play versus work? Sure. I, for me, being a musician for the past 10 years uh, was kind of ultimately what I've always wanted to do. Uh, and that was a big play for me. And I still love playing. I love being on stage, generally with a bass in my hand and not a mic. But um, I love that. And I think it's still play. But I needed something else. And I think when it does become a, something that you do on a regular basis, I think we, our headset changes a little bit. And we get used to the fact that, well, why would I play if I'm not getting paid for it now? And so I think there's that element of, of having to step outside of that. So uh, it's important for me to be playing music for fun and uh, with some friends just to create and not have that mindset of, okay, well, now this is my living. Now I need to make sure I provide for myself by playing. So I think you, it's, you, change, uh, you change how you're thinking of it. And, and so it, from my 
point of view, it is you do need to find another way to, to play outside of that completely. So, yeah, fine line though. Somebody over here has a panda. Who is that? No one? Anyone? In the back. Oh, no. <laughs> because Lola Frost is shy. <laughs> It was, a dram it was a dramatic hand, too. It was a very slow, dramatic hand, yeah. I just want to give everyone an opportunity before I talk. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Nice presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah. Can you please tell me your top three tips for packing a suitcase? Because I'm yeah. totally obsessed oh. with space. This I'm good at. This I'm good at talking about, okay? No more stuttering. No more nothing. Okay. So, <laughs> for one, folding is significantly better than rolling. You don't, you don't create space by rolling. I've done a lot of testing. Rolling creates more wrinkles. It, you know, folding you get a couple of creases, but I call them pleats. So either way, you're gonna if you know if you're living on a suitcase, you're gonna find an iron in a hotel. But so folding for one, two, pack vertically, pack like a filing cabinet because you want to be able to see everything in your bag the moment you open it. Because if you pack it all fancy and you know, you've got that old, like that crazy engineering method that I've seen, that doesn't make any sense for people who actually travel, you're having to take everything out all the time. So if you have it in the, as like a filing cabinet, like vertically, then you're just like, oh, okay, I want these jeans and you know, and so it, it, kind of the third one is, it's a strategic way of how you fold these things. So I always fold it so every t-shirt is folded, you know, the regular way, that the classic one, and then uh, again, but so you can see the chest of the shirt. So if there's a logo or if there's something, a pattern, a pocket, the jeans is always so you can see the back pocket stitching because that differentiates each brand. It's, it gets nerdy, you know, and for one, and for, maybe for, for an added bonus, um, I, t <laughs> yeah, nerd alert. I tend to uh, color coordinate my packing suitcase as well, so I know which shirts I've worn because when I pull one out, then I Nerd. slide it back in the top. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, Sean. Hello. Uh, awesome talk. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper on your, your nerdiness. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the challenge me. Dare you. Okay. Uh, you strike me as a very logical person. 101% of math is probably twice as good as I got. <laughs> but uh, I still consider myself to be a very logical person now. Sure. And I just wonder, uh, maybe some people assume that when you're thinking logically or approaching something logically, play is just not possible because it's, it's just too abstract, it's maybe illogical, and that's how you stay in the moment of play. So maybe you can talk about like, how you work through that. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, because I think I do struggle a lot of times. I am, I am very logical, and, and a lot of times I do think, even what Mark said, you know, that maybe this isn't the most productive of me, of my time. But at the same time, I feel like when I start something, I start, getting into something, I can almost leave a little bit of the logic behind me. And I'm still doing things in a logical manner, but at the same time, I'm, I'm kind of opening myself up a little bit. So it is always a challenge for me to get out of that, that logical headspace. And I think even uh, talking about music, I don't do a lot of the songwriting in, in any of the bands I'm in. I create bass lines, I create kind of music around it, but I think that's almost, I'm too logical, I think, well, if, okay, the perfect pattern is uh, first chorus, first chorus, chorus. And, and I can't think of the, the, how, the mood and how it makes people feel as much because I am too analytical, analytical like that. You know, like I mentioned earlier, my wife has a viewpoint. She's like, oh, this song is so beautiful. And you listen to the lyrics. And I'm like, I have heard this song thousands of times. I've played the song thousands of times. I don't know the lyrics at all. <laughs> it's just for me, the mood that it creates just from the music. But she's thinking at it from a different place. So... I think it's working with other people and being in an environment with other creative people that helps me get out of that because they, I hear their different viewpoints and then I try and take it on almost in their headspace, but, um, but I struggle with it still. So hopefully that kind of answers. Yeah, no I think that speaks to the power of play being a team sport. Yeah. And one of the things that I know I personally struggle with is if I'm not surrounding myself with my team and my team isn't smarter, better, more motivated, more creative than I am. Mm -hmm. If I'm alone, play is really difficult. Yeah. Right? Yes, for if sure. If you're in a dark space or in a mood, it's hard to just go, hey, Mark, let's play. 
Yeah. That'll make you more creative. Yeah. Like, like that slide, the, the passion inspires people. You see right. the passion in others and suddenly, you, But I'll tell you, yeah. the minute I walk into the, in the office and my team is there, yeah. my mood doesn't matter. We, we're together, we're you know, goofing off, mm -hmm. uh, pushing each other, and um, yeah, I think play is a team sport in, in a lot of ways too. But. Very much. And, and, and yeah, I think it's, it's very important and I think we forget about that at times. Mm -hmm. we, we like, no, I can work this out on my own. And, and I, I do that a lot. I'm like, no, I'm probably better just doing it on my own. I don't get distracted. But really, it's the distractions that help me in the end. Hi, Sha. Um, Hello. I just have a question about you uh, touring and collaborating with so many bands yeah. um, in the past. Um, do you have one really memorable moment when uh, you just let go of everything and played with whoever you were with, um, either on the tour bus or, or on stage when you were testing the sound, or mm. do you have that? Um, there are definitely a few times, well, probably more than a few, but uh, I remember a lot, uh, to me a lot of the times were, was the kind of the overall environment, the surroundings, the, um, so some of the big venues that I got to play, uh, definitely the late night shows, that was a childhood dream of mine to be on Letterman, and I got to do Letterman and Leno and, and Conan, and uh, the three of those were all with, with Tegan and Sarah, and it was just an exciting time. And I, I think one of the, in Letterman, the, the picture that I kind of briefly showed, had put an arrow, this guy, um, that was playing a song called Off from Tegan and Sarah that I love. And that was like the first song before I was even really playing with them. That was a song that I just loved so much, and so it meant a lot to me. So to be able to do that uh, on Letterman, well, you know, while while kind of like being part of like my childhood dream, that was a, a big moment for me where I was really loving it and it was, I was able to just be me and I was, you know, it, you do get a little nervous because you're like, There's, we're doing it, it's one take, this is live across the world, but it didn't matter because I was in my element and, and I'm here just playing music and I'm surrounded by people that I really care about and that we all care about each other and we all just want to, you know, do what we do best. So that was a big moment for me. Mm -hmm. Very conservative, quiet, proud to be. I think these empty seats are my musician friends that, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I'll be there. And then I heard they heard it was AM, not oh, PM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You told me a story once. I did? Yeah. Well, when I asked cool. you about the theme play, yeah. and, you, and then you went on about how you like to you frolic. I do. One yeah. of the things, and you drive your bandmates crazy when you're on the road because it's a problem. Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't really want to say that in answer to your question, but partly a lot of times, my most memorable moments on tour are when I uh, we load in all our gear in the morning. Um, generally, there's you know people helping to set that up, and then the moment my my base is there, I depart over here, and generally this is in a country that I didn't even have my phone or I was too cheap to put it, turn it on. So no one could get a hold of me. I just knew I had to be back in two hours. But I didn't know where I was in the city. I'd be in Stockholm, say. And I'd never been to Stockholm. I was so excited. So I just ran around town. Like I literally was running. Just didn't know where I was going. That's a little sketchy. I'm going to go this way. You know? But then I'd, luckily I have a decent sense of, sense of direction, so I knew how to get back. But I would quite often, those are the times where I, I would like actually set up a little video camera and I'd be like climbing this pole and be like, and then I'd like, you know, wave the camera, jump across to another pole and then scale down. I'm like, oh, that could have been bad. You know, <laughs> run back home. And I wouldn't show anyone in the band those videos because uh, I got in trouble far, far too many times for just taking off and not really being around. And then I also, um, well, I would occasionally hurt myself, and that's never good before a show, because, yeah. So those were the times for me that I, my little frolicking times, um, definitely were a little too far. Let's leave it there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.